The Crow may be one of the greatest examples of catching lightning in a bottle. It's a movie that is so tied to its time period that its execution, poetically unique, becomes timeless. Of course, the general idea of The Crow isn't special, an unjust death, avenging the loss of a loved one, and setting the wrong things right. But the reinterpretation of uh, literary tropes mixed with a 90s alternative scene and, well, as the idiom that Iggy Pop once wrote in the reissue of Rob Power goes, the proof is in the pudding. And here we are, 30 plus years later, still discussing how good it still is. But as always, I want to ask, what is the scene that defines it? What makes The Crow so distinctive? Well, let's rock and roll. I'm Lance Velchek, and this is Scene Breakdown. Directed by Alex Proyas and written by John Shirley, rewrites by David Shaw and adapted from James O. Barr's graphic novel, a movie marred with tragedy yet celebrated for its respect of Brandon Lee's legacy. Why does The Crow work? Why are we still talking about it this many years later? Normally I'd break it down with the defining scene, the one that represents the movie best. But with something like The Crow, it just wouldn't be fair. This works on a lot of different levels. Storytelling, visual flair, soundtrack, world building. Would just one scene work here? No, I wouldn't. So f*** it, I'm doing three. Gideon's Pawn Shop does so much with so little. Pointed yet grounded dialogue, fantastic blocking, and some iconic imagery. This is where we really meet Eric Draven. After the mad dog approach of offing Tintin, Eric heads to Gideon's, walking through the glass door, quoting Edgar Allan Poe. I heard a tap as of someone gently rapping. The opening conversation shows us Eric's sense of humor and Brandon Lee's approach to the character. I don't think we really talk about how playful and charming Brandon with the character of Eric really is. Listen to how he tells Gideon that his attempts of defending himself are futile. Mr. Gideon, who? I'm not paying attention. To then, skillfully and with ease, knife his hand to the counter. It's here we first get to see the balance of the character. And I love that the fact that Eric's first stop, once he's suited up, is to retrieve his wedding ring. Eric, feeling for his ring, had some heart. Sticking to the love conquers all theme. While also just kind of tossing every other non-important wedding ring. <laughs> I mean, you know, I gotta respect the balance. Plus, let's not forget, and absolutely let's give some credit to, the always fantastic John Polito. I mean, I forgot about how fully committed he plays Gideon. And that this slummy curmudgeon of a character may just get the best lines of the movie. And my business gets blown up real good. Other than that, my day sucked. I'll give you 50 bucks. I hate charities. Take the fucking rates out. Take the fucking rates out. You shoot them. And you choke on them, you son of a bitch. And everything comes to a close when Eric lets Gideon know he must not forget about the gasoline. And promptly blows it all to hell. Michael Wincott plays top dollar with a surgeon's precision of apathy, overindulgence, and charm. I mean, the dude might just have the coolest voice of all time. If bourbon and a cigar could become one and then sentient, it would sound like the great Michael Wincott. I think we ought to have an introspective moment of silence for poor old Tint. His speech at the end is another aspect that embodies why the crow works. This is a dark fairy tale filtered through the grungy and goth aesthetics merged with the heart of the 90s. I mean, think about it like this. Uh, the king lets his men rape and pillage. A lowly peasant must face said king and avenge his princess. We get a sword fight finish at the top of a church. I mean, hell, Top Dollar is wearing period garb, and it even ends with a kiss. But in this fairy tale, it's always raining, everything is in urban decay, and problems are solved the old-fashioned way, with guns. By shooting anyone and everyone. Okay, so this scene opens with an overhead dolly shot showing the power and size of the villain and his henchmen. 
Skank is wounded and being held by top enforcer slash assassin, Grage, the great Mr. Tony Todd. As Top Dollar lays out his bait and show of strength for the celebration of Devil's Night. Greed is for amateurs. Disorder, chaos, anarchy. Now that's fun. I mean, if I'm being honest, it's a surprisingly motivating and inspiring speech. You know, just set in the, the mind of a psychopathic tyrant. And then Eric walks in, I mean, with a swagger like no other, and his point-blank delivery. I just want him. Well, you can have him. To then this becoming a Hong Kong shootout. Here is the ideal example of tone. It's both cool yet believably bleak, engaging and well-shot action. Plus, it shows how flawless the humor is executed throughout. The crow is constantly making me laugh, yet never, ever taking away from the severity of the situation. And of course, we cannot leave out the creation of the crow persona. Now, this is where the tragedy needed skill and innovation to honor the legacy of Brandon Lee. Him entering the apartment is a really well done composite of Eric earlier in the alleyway. We had a lot of POV shots, shots from behind, and other tricks to cover the double's face. And as a scene, it's crucial. And this is the big sell of the movie. And this workaround doesn't take anything away narratively. In fact, it's one of the greatest scenes in the movie. This iconic shot uses a digital composite of Brandon's face over his stunt double. But let's look at the scene in terms of storytelling. Having Eric remember his life and overcome with intense, crippling emotion, creating the ego of Avenger through unfiltered anger is something that is nailed perfectly in this type of slightly off-kilter reality. Finding his healing powers in an over-the-top way to aggressively painting his face even taking a little time out of his day to pet the damn cat. And it's all scored to the cure's burn. It's a genuinely beautiful scene that's exaggerations fit soundly together in the grim urban goth aesthetic. It's the scene that establishes its cultural tone, summing up the vibe in both sound and vision. And of course, the music in this movie is objectively perfect. I know it has long had the credit of being a great movie soundtrack, but this is one of the very few times that it's blended into the fictional world so flawlessly. Of course, there are many other iconic moments here. The ending fight with Top Dollar, Eric using his grief and pain as the ultimate weapon. And one that should have made this list is the sweet moment when Ernie Hudson's character opens up to Eric. The one that ends with him foregoing the theatrics and just leaving like the rest of us. Are you gonna vanish into thin air again? I thought I'd use your front door. The Crow has always been a childhood memory for me. Hanging out at the aisles of the video store, hanging out at Family Video, renting this over and over. This one movie might have taught me about the power of world building through style. It's lightning in a bottle in the most cinematic sense. Everything somehow worked despite so much sadness. To make something this unique, tied to its era and unable to successfully reproduce the Crow is lightning in a bottle. I mean, part two understood the world, but failed the characters. Number three had more focused intentions and kind of blended one and two, but didn't have the budget or intelligence to make anything but a low rent copy. And f the fourth movie. In the end, The Crow has endured the changing of times because its story and message are timeless. While the world in this story is a remembrance for when you could be weird with a decent budget and execute an actual vision, art is an important building block of life. And I'm glad to live in an era where I got to experience this story firsthand. I miss the sentimental nature and creativity of this type of storytelling. And as I look back this many years later, I can tell it's something we all took for granted with 90s cinema. Street race, you motherfucker! Is that gasoline I smell? <laughs> Seems like the world is moving on. Didn't stop to look around. Didn't get a shit if you're crashing down. You can close your eyes, but not